typical oratory of the region in both the Jim Crow era and the Civil Rights era, and has continued on into our own times among black politicians, preachers, and activists. Touchy pride, vanity, and boastful self-dramatization were also part of this redneck culture among people from regions of Britain where the civilization was the least developed. Mm. They boast and lack self-restraint, Olmsted said, after observing their descendants in the American antebellum South. While Professor Grady McWhiney's cracker culture is perhaps the most thorough historical study of the values and behavioral patterns of white Southerners, Many other scholarly studies have turned up very similar patterns, even when they differed in some ways as to the causes. Professor David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed, for example, challenges the Celtic Connection thesis put forth by Professor McWhiney, but shows many of the same cultural patterns among the same people, both in Britain and in the American South. Hmm. Popular writings of the 19th and 20th centuries have likewise described similar behavior including the Indianapolis residents' comments on white Southern migrants to that city, which sounds so much like what many have said about ghetto blacks. Mm. None of this is meant to claim that these patterns have remained rigidly unchanged over the centuries, or that there are literally no differences between whites and blacks in any aspects of this subculture. However, what is remarkable is how pervasive and how close the similarities have been. Centuries before black pride became a fashionable phrase, there was cracker pride, and it was very much the same kind of pride. It was not pride in any particular achievement or set of behavioral standards or moral principles adhered to. It was instead a touchiness about anything that might be even remotely construed as a personal slight, much less an insult, combined with a willingness to erupt into violence over it. New Englanders were baffled about this kind of pride among crackers. Observing such people, the Yankees could not understand what they had to feel proud about. However, this kind of pride is perhaps best illustrated by an episode reported in Professor McWhiney's Cracker Culture. Wow. When an Englishman, tired of waiting for a Southerner to start working on a house he had contracted to build, hired another man to do the job, the enraged Southerner, who considered himself dishonored, vowed, Tomorrow morn I will come with men and twenty rifles and I will have your life, or you shall have mine. Oh. In the vernacular of our later times, he had been dissed, and he was not going to stand for it, that's regardless right. of the consequences for himself or others. That's, that's I like. The history of the antebellum South yeah, like. is full of episodes showing the same pattern, whether expressed in the highly formalized duels of the aristocracy or in the no-holds-barred style of fighting called rough and tumble mm -hmm. among the common folk a style that included biting off ears and gouging out eyes. It was not simply that particular isolated individuals did such things. Social approval was given to these practices, as illustrated by this episode in the antebellum. I hear you. I'm so tired of thee. <laughs> I know. I was, actually, I was seeing thinking about when Mike Tyson bit Holyfield <laughs> ear for some reason. I was like, oh, my gosh. Oof. A crowd gathered and arranged itself in an impromptu ring. The contestants were asked if they wished to fight fair or rough and tumble. When they chose rough and tumble, a roar of approval rose from the multitude. This particular fight ended with the loser's nose bitten off, oh. his ears torn off, Ooh. and both his eyes gouged out, oh. after which the victor himself, maimed and bleeding, was chaired round the grounds to the cheers of the crowd. No, sir. This almost like that Kimball is slice. till death. That's what Jesus. it seemed like. Fin tumble style of fighting was also popular in the southern highlands of Scotland, where grabbing an opponent's testicles and attempting to castrate him by hand was also an accepted practice. How does that work? Uh, uh, you just gonna pull until it it comes from the skin. How can you do that? Well. Think about it. That skin is strong, but if you got all that pressure yanking them, do you know them nuts? Are, that's so sensitive. Your whole head will lock up from touching that. So, so that, that is, is possible. It's just a, it's just skin that's holding it. That's a, that's horrible. How does somebody want to do that? <sighs> oh my god. Oh man. Scottish Highlanders were in centuries past part of the Celtic fringe or North Britons. 
outside the orbit of English culture, not only as it existed in England, but also in the Scottish lowlands. The Highlanders lagged far behind the lowlanders in education and economic progress, as well as in the speaking of the English language, for Gaelic was still widely spoken by Highlanders in the 19th century, not only in Scotland for itself, Gaelic. but also in North Carolina and in Australia, where immigrants from the Scottish Highlands were unable to communicate with English-speaking people, including lowland Scots who had also immigrated. That's just like somebody, you came from the north, and then you come down and somebody straight from, straight from, from AT, uh, straight from, um, from Bowen Homes, and then they got that, they got that lingo, and he's like, what English? What is that English? What'd you say? Wow. You don't have to understand, you, it's English, but it ain't the English, you, you can't understand it unless you're around it. Somebody from Atlanta, OG Atlanta, speak it, speak it deep, I understand every word they say, where right. somebody else be like, what? Huh? Exactly. What? Yeah. In the Hebrides Islands off Scotland, Gaelic had still not completely died out in the middle of the 20th century. What is important in the pride and violence patterns among rednecks and crackers was not that particular people did particular things at particular times and places, nor is it necessary to attempt to quantify such behavior. What is crucial is that violence growing out of such pride had social approval. As Professor McWhiney pointed out, men often killed and went free in the South, just as in earlier times they had in Ireland and Scotland. As one observer in the South noted, enemies would meet, exchange insults, and one would shoot the other down, professing that he had acted in self-defense because he believed the victim was armed. Wow. When such a story was told in court, in a community where it is not a strange thing for men to carry about their person's deadly weapons, each member of the jury feels that he would have done the same thing under similar circumstances, so that in condemning him, they would but condemn themselves. The actions of Southern courts often amazed outsiders, Professor McWhiney said. But what may be even more revealing of widespread attitudes were the cases that never even went to trial. Right. As another study of white Southerners put it, <clears throat> to many rural Southerners, rather than a set of legal statutes, justice remained a matter of societal norms allowing for respect of property rights, individual honor, and a maximum of personal independence. Any violation of this pattern amounted to a breach of justice requiring a specific response from the injured party. Upon learning that a youthful neighbor had approached his wife in an overly friendly manner, mm. Robert Leard of Tangipahoa, Louisiana, promptly tracked the young man down and killed him. Under the Whoa! Hey, fella. Hey, fella. You're not supposed to be... Batting your eyes and whistling at, my, whistling at my wife. Hey, I saw you look at my little baby, you know. <laughs> you look at my little baby. He's cute. Anything. Hey, beautiful. Hey, oh my gosh. Tiny Woods Code of Justice. Anything less would have invited shame and ridicule upon the Leard family. Intensity of personal pride was connected by Olmstead with the fiend like street fights of the South. Wow. He mentioned an episode of public murder with impunity. Mm. A gentleman of veracity, now living in the South, told me that among his friends he had once numbered two young men who were themselves intimate friends, to one of them, taking offense at some foolish words uttered by the other, challenges him. A large crowd assembled to see the duel, which took place on a piece of prairie ground. The combatants right. came armed with rifles, and at the first interchange of shots, fight the club. challenged man fell disabled by a ball in the thigh. Nah, that wasn't no fight club. It was a fight broke out, and then somebody said it had that fire. Fire, 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 fire. That's what they had. That's, that's, that's what, what that is. They were playing to the death like But, that, but that makes so much sense. The cultural standpoint of low-level whites with low-level blacks, they match in things they did, sound, how things were done. That makes so much sense because I never could figure out where black, where we get this language and where we get it from. And come to find out, yeah. it comes, it comes from white, from the white community. We didn't have a, we didn't have a um, black people that were brought here to America. Of course, didn't have, have any identification. They did not have, they didn't know who they were. So you had to adapt to somebody, right? And you weren't going to adapt to the high level people that were in the country. Nope. So that's that's factual. Mm-hmm. You dapped to somebody. The other, throwing down his rifle, walked toward him 
and kneeling by his side, drew a buoy knife and deliberately butchered him. Uh. The crowd of bystanders not only permitted this, but the execrable assassin still oh, lives in the community, oh, has since married, house. and, Yay. as far as my informant could judge, his social position has been rather advanced than otherwise wow. from thus dealing with his enemy. Again, what is important here oh. is not the isolated incident itself, mm. but the set of social attitudes which allowed such incidents to take place publicly with impunity. The killer knowing in advance that what he was doing had community approval. Moreover, such attitudes went back for centuries on both sides of the Atlantic, at least among the particular people concerned. During the era when dueling became a pattern dueling. among... Dueling. But look how he stands, though. You and he is not ready to fight. He is only ready to shoot. That's what and, I was trying and, to And a mannequin, flamboyant sample. Pow! Dueling. Pump. Pow! <laughs> for class Americans between the Revolutionary War and the... I'm just looking at him, how he looked, and he sounded like he would say something like that. Okay. It was particularly prevalent in the South. As a social history of the United States noted, of Southern statesmen who rose to prominence after 1790, hardly one can be mentioned who was not involved in a duel. Mm. Editors of Southern newspapers became involved in duels so often that cartoonists depicted them with a pen in one hand and a dueling pistol in the other. Most duels arose not over substantive issues, but over words considered insulting. Mm. At lower social levels, Southern feuds such as that between the Hatfields and the McCoys, which began in a dispute over a pit. Hey, hey, fella, your, your, your ma'am I've just got one of those big old caboodies. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want to, oh, I challenge you to a duel. <laughs> sure, bam, because they didn't even really play fair back then either, so. And ultimately claimed more than 20 lives became legendary. Wow. It has been estimated that, while at least three quarters of the settlers in colonial New England originated in the lowland southeastern half of Britain, a similarly large proportion of the population of the South originated in the Scottish Highlands, Ireland, Wales, or the northern and western uplands of England. Those arriving from Ireland in colonial times would have been from Ulster County, where Scots and Englishmen settled.